So if you were here, you may remember that I described the Holy Spirit based on Romans chapter 8 as the spirit of freedom, power, love, security, empowerment, guidance, and adoptions. And I left the last point out so we could talk about it today uh, as we talk about the spirit uh, like a spirit of glory, which is in verse 17. Now, there's a reason why I left that out last week, and we're going to bring it back today, is because I, as I read Romans chapter 8, it seems to me that verse 17 is a transitional verse. That means that when you read the Bible, there are verses that connect two sections of, of the scripture. So in my, from my perspective, verse 17 is making a connection between the first part of Romans 8 and the second part of Romans 8. And the reason why I say that is because when you read Romans 8, 17, you see that there are two words that you also find in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the following verse, which are the same two words. That's how we know that this is a transitional verse. And this is what Paul says in verse 17, that if you are a believer, you will suffer with Jesus. Welcome to church. And that then, eventually, you also will be glorified with Jesus. And then, just in case you think that was a grammatical error, he repeats the same thing in verse 18. That if you are a believer, you will suffer in this present time. But that there's another part for our story in which we will all experience glory. So these two concepts, suffering and glory... Is basically the description of what it means to be a believer in a broken world and what the Lord promises that he's going to do one day. Suffering and glory. So my job today is to convince you, as much as I can, if you're not convinced just yet, that suffering is not an option. That as much as you want to avoid it and try to pretend that it doesn't happen, or if you believe in some prosperity gospel stuff, that is not how Christianity looks like. So my job today is to convince you that this is the reality of what it means to live in this broken world. So we're going to see three things. We're going to see the pattern, the incentives, and the anchor. So I, I, wanna, I want you to say something really inspiring to one another because this is a heavy text. Something really inspiring. This is what you're going to say to the person next to you. There is no way around suffering. Go ahead, go ahead. Now, you're visiting for the first time, you're saying, this is like the worst day to come to this church. <laughs> Hannibal is in a cheerful spirit today. Let's go with the four, point number one, and I got to tell you why is it that I asked you to do that. It's because I actually believe that for some reason, some of us still believe that suffering is not part of the equation. <laughs> actually, I could, I could make my point super clear. If you ever ask the question, why, Lord? That's the answer. If that question ever came out of your mouth, that's the evidence that we're still very much surprised by suffering. And Paul knows that. And Paul knows that suffering is not an option, that there is a pattern in life and a spiritual life in which we all suffer and we will all experience glory. That's the pattern. That just as Jesus suffered before glory, we all going to suffer before glory, we like it or not. That we are following the steps of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That there is no way around it. That you cannot avoid it. That you cannot uh, excuse it. That you, it's just the reality of what it means to live, uh, be a, a human living in a broken world. What is interesting about this passage, though, is that Paul is not only going to talk about suffering in terms of humanity, but he starts to make an argument about suffering in terms of nature. So basically he says that in nature, both nature and humanity will experience the same pattern, suffering first and then glory. So look at what he says, what he, uh, how he talks about uh, creation or nature in verses 19 to 21. Look at the words he uses. Verse 19 says, for the creation waits with eager longing. Can you say eager? <laughs> Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility. Can you say futility? <laughs> and verse 21, he talks about creation experiencing this bondage to corruption. Now, what I, the, the, 
the reason why I love those expressions is because those, in my opinion, those are picture words. You understand the concept of picture word? It's, it's a word that is said, but it's inviting you to imagine something. It's, it's painting a picture in your head so you understand what Paul is saying. And every single one of those words, in my opinion, are picture words. So, for example, the word eager literally can be translated as someone being on their tiptoes, stretching the neck. That is the straight translation. And their tiptoes, stretching the neck. Now, why do I do this? So you remember that that is the description of creation. Creation in itself. Nature in itself. In its tiptoes. Looking for something better. That's a, that's a profound description of what creation, quote unquote, feels. It also uses the word futility, which can also be translated as empty or meaningless. And this is what um, it, the book of Ecclesiastes talks about. And what, what the author there says is that regardless of how much we do, how much we conquer the, conquer the places we go, the things we buy, everything is vanity. Everything is meaningless, meaning nothing really satisfies. And Paul says that creation has the same meaning, the same, uh, the same um, internal struggle, if you will. That nature in itself sometimes, quote unquote, feels that everything is meaningless, empty. And then he talks about creation being bound to corruption, which the word corruption means decay or means death, meaning that everything beautiful in creation will not stay beautiful, that at one point everything gets broken down. Everything diminishes. All beauty disappears. Everything in creation is like that. Picture anything beautiful in this world and give it a few years and you will see that that beauty disappears. That's how creation is. He's actually going to make this even more clear in verse 22 when he says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And I know that ladies look at this verse, especially if you're a mother, and you would say, I understand that verse, and I'm, I'm here to say, no, you don't. Because you, you have never been in the place the first century church was. So this is the thing. When Paul is using this concept of groaning, it's not just like, uh, uh, that's a complaint. Groaning, in, in the meaning of the word, groaning is feeling that you're about to die. Now, I know that the ladies would say, well, you don't know what I felt. Well, just wait. <laughs> because even if you understand the pains of childbirth, you live in an era in which we have something by common grace called epidural. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask you how many of you guys used it, but I'm sure that a lot of you ladies used it. Even if, you, even if you lie. But even if you didn't, you are not all part of a culture that has the tech. We have the technology and we have the science that first century people didn't have. So when Paul is using this description of groaning with the pains of childbirth, he knows that everyone there would understand what that means. Because back in those days, first century people, to be pregnant meant that there was a high probability of you dying. So it wasn't just, I'm going to have babies. No, 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 no. You're going to have babies, but it's a high probability that you will die. And Paul uses that imagery to explain what creation feels. Slowly and gradually dying. That is the effect of sin in this creation. That is the effect of your sin and my sin in this creation. Completely destroying what the Lord created beautiful in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Now what is interesting here is that Paul uses that to explain what humanity also feels like when we suffer. So he goes from nature and he moves to uh, humanity. And in verse 23, he says, And not only the creation suffers, but we ourselves, humanity, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption. And if you notice, Paul is using a similar language, language between creation and, nature, and, and humanity. 
It says that we groan inwardly. That could be translated as we are deeply concerned. We are in a constant stress. That's what that word means. It's a stress that pills won't take away. It's a stress that you cannot fix. It's part of what it means to live in this broken world. Broken human beings living in a broken world. And it also means that just as creation is on its tiptoes looking for something better, humanity as well in general is in the tiptoes tiptoe looking for something better. That's the description of the spiritual condition of humanity. Listen up, church. And just as nature is breaking down, gradually breaking down because of the effect of sin in the world, you and I are also gradually breaking down. So if you're less than 30 years old, you're like, that's not true. Just wait. <laughs> Listen, past 30, man, I'll give you 35 maybe because I'm generous today. Maybe 35. But past 35, man, your, your intellectual capacities, they, they start to break down. And your abilities, they tend to break down. Not as fast as you once were, like when you were five. And your bodies, they start to break down. How many of you guys say amen to that? Amen. You see, that's most of the church. Why do you think that people use makeup? Like, really, ask the question, why do people? I'm saying people because it's both males and females nowadays. Because we no longer have the natural color that once we had when we were really young, whether you like it or not. Why do you think that people put so much effort for the wedding day? Because you don't want to see brokenness in the pictures. Everything is breaking down. You know, when I got married, I got a nice suit, and Heidi has a nice dress, and she puts a lot of makeup, and I, you know, I did what I could, and... And part of the reason why we look so nice is because we didn't want anybody else to see behind all of that stuff. Everything is breaking down. I, this is the description of what it means to live in a broken world. This is why someone came with the brilliant idea of filters for social media. Oh. You don't want to see people, how they get up early in the morning. I guess that's, that's not a nice picture. This is crazy, though. This is the description of humanity. That's the description of sin and humanity living in a broken world. But Paul is going to say that if that is true for humanity in general, that's even more true for Christians. This is even more true for believers because the moment you decided to place your faith in Jesus Christ, if you have, you were choosing to suffer even more. <laughs> this is interesting because when people are trying to recruit you into Christianity, they never tell you this. And you know why they never tell you this? Because you wouldn't become a Christian. But that's what the Bible says. The Bible is much more honest than Christians are. Actually, that is the whole point of the second section of, of the book of Romans. Of Romans chapter 8. You know, there's a bunch of questions from uh, verses 35 on. Actually, no, no, before that, in verse 31, for example, it says that Christians, uh, people will go against Christianity. I, I see that happening. And verse 33 says that, we will, that there will be charges against Christians. Well, I see that happening. In verse 34 says that Christians will be condemned. Well, we'll see that happening. And then look at what it says in verses 35 to 36 to top it off. It says that we should all experience tribulations and distress and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword. Verse 36. And that we're all going to be considered, we're going to consider ourselves like to be killed, like sheep to be slaughtered. That's Christianity. You know why people never write about this stuff? Because we don't make money if we write about that stuff. Since sin entered the world, creation suffers. Humanity suffers, and believers suffer. There is no way around it. Welcome to church. See, this, this is the reason why this is the reason why people have never written a book that says, 
you want to be a Christian, learn to suffer. There's a reason why no one has written that book. They read articles, but not a book. This is what it means to be a believer. And Paul is super honest. So you got to ask the question, how is it then? Because that message has always been there. How is it then, then that Christianity became the fastest growing religion in the first century? You got to ask the question. What is it that Christianity offered that was completely different to everything else? And I want to make the argument that part of what made Christianity so popular was precisely this concept about suffering. Because no one likes to talk about this. And yet we all suffer. Either you suffered yesterday or you will suffer today or you will suffer tomorrow. Everyone suffers and what Christianity offers is something so beautiful. So perfect, so profound that made Christianity the fastest growing religion in the first century. And it's still today the fastest growing religion in the world. See, if you are uh, exploring Christianity and you have secular tendencies, you you are right to say, well, maybe I don't want to become Christian if this is the case. But if that's your case, let me ask you a question. Because suffering is a reality of what it means to be a human being. When you suffer, what is it that you're going to cling to? You have nothing to cling to. Christians, on the other hand, have something to cling to. We are not surprised by suffering. We expect some level of suffering. The difference is that we have something to cling to. This is why if you have been influenced by the prosperity gospel, you got to reject that garbage. Because everyone here will go through pain. There is no way around it. This is why Eastern religions can't help you because they said, this is how you avoid. Or this is how you escape from suffering. Like, do these spiritual practices. It doesn't matter how much you do. Do you still live in this broken world? And even if you are bought into the idea that you can actually uh, distract yourself from, uh, from uh, suffering or avoid suffering altogether, that's a modern way of thinking. That is not the Bible. There is no way around it. The question then we have to answer is, what is it that Christians have that not only we can survive suffering, but flourish in and through suffering? What is it that believers have? That allows us not just to expect suffering and endure suffering, but flourish in and through suffering. And this takes me to my second point. The incentives. This is what I want you to know here. There is a way for you to learn how to suffer well. There is a way... For you to learn to suffer well. And Paul here, just in this text, is going to give us four things. Number one, you have an incomparable glory. Look at what it says in verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worth comparing with the glory that it is to be revealed to us. And I want you to stop there for a second because the word that he used at the beginning, consider, it's an accounting word. It's what an accountant would do. An accountant takes numbers and then adds and subtracts and tries to balance things out. And here you have Paul saying something like this. I have taken into consideration everything that I'm losing in the present. And then I pay attention to what is yet to come. And I realize that this beautiful thing that is yet to come is much, 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 much better than anything I go through here right now. That's what he calls it in verse 19, the revealing of the sons of God. In verse 21, the freedom of the glory of the children of God. He says that our future glory is so amazing, so profound, so perfect, so secure, so fulfilling that when you put that next to the suffering we go through here, eventually this will look just like a bad dream. You know what I promise as Christians? 
We don't think much of what is yet to come. Because we are obsessed with what we have in front of us. That's the difference. But I guarantee you that the more you think, meditate, and embrace what is yet to come, the more you learn how to flourish in and through suffering. The image of our future really shapes the way we suffer today. You know, a few months ago, I, I, I took an Uber, traveling somewhere, so I took an Uber, and the driver was an African man. Super cool guy. Super cool, super animated, and he had crazy good music, and he had decorations in the car all over the place. He had this really cool driver, and I found it so interesting that I just, I wanted to hear his story, and why is it that he came, how long he came, and all that stuff. Um, and he tells me that he comes from a section from, from part in Africa that, experience, that has a lot of poverty and, um, and violence and that he realized that the only way that he was going to be able to help and support the family was to actually get out of there, to come here, to help them there. Now, that's the immigrant story. I've heard that 20,000 times. What I've never heard is, though, what he knew he would go through before he took that journey. Like, he knew that this was going to be painful. He knew that it would be months and months and months to live from Africa to the United States. Nine months it took him to get here. Nine months. And he says that it was super weird because he got from Africa and they took him to Ecuador, which is South America. And from Ecuador, he went to Colombia. And from Colombia, he went to Panama. And from Panama, he went to Mexico. And from Mexico, he came to the United States. And in this journey, he tells me everything that he saw, the crazy things he saw. People dead on the road, people starving to death, nights in the street, all of these things. And I'm listening to this story, and I'm thinking, why would this man choose this path? And the concept came to mind. Desperation. How desperate you have to be to be willing to take that journey. I shared this a few months before. I heard about these, these females coming from Central America that they know that in that journey, there was a high probability that they would be raped. And they took the journey. Why? Desperation. So I'm thinking here, would I do that? And this is what we can learn from people like that, which I think is what Paul has in mind. When you have the probability of a better future, that dictates how you live your present. How is this different to Christianity? Is that for believers, it's not a probability. It's a fact. Because Jesus died and resurrected, our future glory is secure. There will be a time of peace and joy and restoration. There will be a time of flourishing. There will be a time of fulfilling. This is why the word hope in the Bible is so important. Hope for us is not wishful thinking. It's certainty. And Paul says, this is how you live. Even in the midst of suffering, knowing that we have an incomparable glory. I would say that that would be enough. But not for Paul. He's got more. We also have a secure deposit. Look at what it says in verse 23. We ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit, we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And notice that he says really quick that redemption for Christians is not that just our inner being, our immaterial being, is just going to go to heaven and then flow like little angels. That's not what he says. Actually, he says that not only our inner being is going to be restored, but that our bodies will be restored. That one time, at one moment in a future glory, both our body and our soul will be completely restored. Now, notice this. He's saying... 
that, that, that we know that that is going to happen for one thing in this verse. And the thing is that if you are a believer, you have the first fruits of the Spirit. Meaning that when the Spirit came to you, he came to you as a down payment or a deposit that that future will happen. Think from a financial perspective. If you want to buy something and if you put a down payment, you are saying, this is going to be mine. That's exactly what the Spirit does. He comes into the heart of the believers and says, this is the down payment. You want to know if you're going to make it to future glory? Look at the Spirit living inside of you. That is certainty. Even in the midst of suffering. Even if you can't see what the Lord is doing. Even when you have more questions than answers. And with that, Paul is going to give me a third thing that I need in my suffering. And he talks about this faithful intercessor. Verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us, we groaning too deep for words. Verse 27, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And it's interesting because the scholars have different opinions about what those verses mean. Some scholars would say, well, what this means is that if you struggle and you are going through pain and things go wrong, sometimes you don't know what to say. Have you, have you anybody of you guys ever experienced that? And they say, and in those moments, the spirit that gives you the words so you know how to pray. And I would say, yeah, that happens sometimes. Other scholars would say, no, no, no. What that means is that when you go through pain and a struggle and all of these things, words just won't come out. And in that moment, the Spirit prays on your behalf or prays for you. And I would say, yeah, that also happens. So I'm not a new scholar, but I think that both of these guys just got to come together and have a big old party. Because I actually think that the verse means both things. That when we struggle, either the, the Spirit gives you the words so you know how to pray, or he prays for you. But the point at the end of the day is this, that regardless of how much you suffer, that regardless of how much you struggle, and regardless of how much we lose, we are never alone. The Holy Spirit is always present, either praying with us or praying for us. But at the end of the day, we are never alone. Even when we suffer. See, we have uh, an incomparable glory. We have a secure deposit. We have a faithful, beautiful intercessor. And there's more. We have an extraordinary, extraordinary promise. Verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And I'm 100% I'm sure that 99% of this church have heard that verse, prayed that verse, or applied that verse somehow. Anybody here that this verse is new to you? I thought so. You know what I also learned in my 20 years of ministry? That may be one of the most misunderstood and misapplied verses in the Bible. Because first, we almost read this verse like if it's karma. If you do good, things will end up being good. That's karma. That's not Christianity. Or if you do bad... Things will go bad. That's karma. That's not Christianity. So this is how people would explain this verse. Some people, not you guys, other churches. <laughs> they would say, well, as Christians, regardless of what we go through, God would always turn those things into good things. And I would say, explain. And then they give me an illustration like this. 
So I wanted to get, I, you know, I needed a job, and I was broke. And I finally found this beautiful job, perfect job, a lot of money. I was going to get everything that I, that I needed. I was finally going to stop being poor forever. But on the way to the job interview, I got into an accident, a really bad accident. I lost my car, and now I'm broken ribs, broken legs, broken arms, broken head, broken everything. And I was like, wow, where is this story going? But then he says, but don't worry, Hannibal, because all these work together for good. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? He says, this is what happened. When I went to the hospital, I met the lady of my dreams. And we got married. Mm. All things work together for good. And I'm like, uh, that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> I mean, if that's your story, man, praise God. Praise God. That's great. That's, I'm happy for you. But that is not what the text says. And the reason why I'm so confident in saying that that is not what the text says is because you have to remember the context of the text. The context dictates everything. And you have to remember that the text is talking about future glory. There's not one verse in the Bible that promises that if you behave well, things will end up being good today. There is no promise in the Bible that says if you come to church and read the Bible and do all these things, that things, bad things will turn out to be really good things in the present time. There is no verse that says that. And if you find it, you're probably interpreting it wrong. This is talking about future glory. So you got to ask the question then, what does Paul mean by this? And I think that the answer is so simple, so beautiful, so amazing. This is what he says. That in all things, you know what all things mean? You, you, you do know Greek. That's, uh, that's awesome. That in all things, not some things, but all things, work is using those things for your good, even suffering. That's the context of the text. That God uses all things for your good, even suffering. This has taught me so much about Christianity. See, it has taught me that I don't have permission to waste my suffering. That in the midst of whatever I go through, I know that the Lord is shaping me and transforming me into the man that he wants me to be. I know. It, it has taught me that God is always good because only a good God could use evil for my good. See, this has taught me that I could never say anything like, I don't see anything good coming out of this. Isn't that what people told Jesus when he was nailed to the cross? And yet we are here. See, this has taught me that it is possible to rejoice. This is Colossians chapter 1. To rejoice in suffering. Not to rejoice for suffering because that will be masochism. But to rejoice in suffering. Why? Because, yes, we are living in, a pre in this present world. We will suffer. And, yes, there is no way around it. But in the midst of all of these things, God in his providential perfect work is always using even evil to shape me in the way that he wants me to be shaped like. He's using all things for my good. What he sends is for your good. What he allows is for your good, even if it doesn't make any sense to you. Our God is not restricted by the things we go through. Our God is so powerful that he can use even the things we hate to shape us into the people that we ought to be. This is crazy, church. And this is free, man. It, take this, sell it, and you'll be rich. This is enough. For Christians, suffering can only make you better. 
I told you it was good. For Christians, suffering in the hands of God can only make you better. We're not called to enjoy. We're not called to not pretend that nothing. No, it's, I, I'm going to say something that I'm not supposed to say, but I'll say it anyway. Suffering sucks. <laughs> but the Lord uses it for our good. If there's one person in church history that understood this really well, it was Martin Luther. So the, the way when he's uh, confronting the Catholic Church, because they were selling uh, forgiveness, basically, he's confronting the church, and then getting all public, and then the church went after him. And this is what he says in one of his writings. He says, the devil will afflict you, and will make a real doctor of you, and will teach you by his temptations to seek and to love God's word. Suffering makes you love God's word. For I myself owe my papists many thanks for the beatings, pressings, and frightening me through the devil's raging that they have turned me into a fairly good theologian, driving me to a goal that I should never have reached. You know why is that so important? Martin Luther became a great theologian because he had to suffer. That's the same, same thing for you. And the same thing for me. What religion in the world gives you that? Only Christianity. Now, this is the thing. This is a future glory. But the present is really painful. Don't you think? Like anyone here enjoys, enjoys suffering so we could pray for you, get the devil out of you? No, man, that's, that's painful. How, ma how many of you guys agree? So how do we learn to wait? How do, how do we keep grounded so we don't lose hope and wait patiently? See, the image that comes to mind, we're like a little boat in the middle of the storm. Man, and the boat is going to be shaking like left and right. That's your life. And, and right now, you're having a nice break. That's fine. It's a, it's a break. It'll come back. You, you'll be like the float. You've seen those, the floating. The, you get the stuff in the bottom. That's you. That's life. Right? There's no way around it. So how in the midst of this shaking, how do you keep grounded so you don't lose hope? And this is the anchor, point number three. And this is the whole beautiful section at the bottom that basically is talking about Jesus. So look at what he says really fast in verse 29. He says that we know that we are secure for the, because we know that for those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Verse 30. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those who justified, he would, always, he would also glorify. Basically, this is the summary of how someone becomes a Christian. Listen up, church. If you are a believer, if you already profess with your mouth, believe in your mind and your heart that Jesus is Lord, the only reason why you're there is because God foreknew you. You know what that means? Is that he pre-loved you. He chose to love you even before you loved him. And because he, he loved you, pre-loved you, now he calls you into his presence. Now he predestined you and now he calls you. And he calls you to believe in Jesus Christ, to believe that he lived and died and resurrected. And when you have that, now you are being justified. And if you are being justified, then one day you will be glorified. That is the story of salvation. It's all about Jesus, though. And you will say, how do you know that it's all about Jesus? Listen up. Because the ultimate evidence that God pre-loved you and predestined you and called you is because Jesus justified you. That's your anchor. This could never be taken away. This is the security you have even when you're being shaken around. This is your anchor. And if that is true, listen up, church. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what the last section says? Verse 35. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in this creation, anything else in this creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's your anchor. How do you know? That you make it to future glory because of who Jesus is and Jesus did. You know what's crazy about this text? I love it. Right at the beginning it says that there are no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And he finishes saying that there is no separation for those who are in Jesus Christ. That's the book end of your life. No condemnation, no separation. And that's how we learn to suffer well. Amen? Let's pray. So my prayer for us, Lord, is that we learn to suffer well. That we don't waste our suffering That we learn to accept the reality that this is what it means to live in a broken world. But that we embrace, Lord, the promises of a better future, the incomparable glory, the security that we have, the down payment that we have in, in the spirit, the one that is interceding for us and with us. That we remember, Lord, that we are never alone. And that we remember that all things eventually will work for our good. Sometimes here, but for sure in heaven. Lord, and to find rest, I pray that we cling to the one that did it all for us, Jesus Christ, and never move from that. And we pray for all this in the name of Jesus and the church says.